Google enables new ad settings by default, patch your iPhone ASAP, and Microsoft spills the tea on a recent hack. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. <laughs> Greetings, I am Shannon Morris, and this is ThreatWire for September 12, 2023. This is your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. Let's go ahead and jump right into the news this week. Google has officially begun rolling out its privacy sandbox in the Chrome web browser, as well as in Android 13, to the majority of its users almost four months after they first announced those plans. Now, the privacy sandbox is a controversial topic. This is because it tackles third-party tracking cookies, but it still delivers personalized ads. Now, Google introduced the Privacy Sandbox as a solution to keep delivering interest-based advertising while respecting GDPR privacy regulations. So how does it work? Well, the Privacy Sandbox computes your interests right in your browser instead of relying on third-party tracking cookies. It uses a feature called Add Topics to categorize your interests based on the websites you visit. But it's not just Add Topics. There's also Site Suggested Ads, which lets websites tell Chrome which types of ads to show you, and Ad Measurement, which allows sites and advertisers to measure ad performance while keeping your browser history private. Now, one of the big players in this game is the Topics API. This text sorts users into different topics based on the websites they visit, which websites can use to serve personalized ads without knowing exactly who you are. But privacy advocates, like the Movement for an Open Web, have voiced concerns about Google gathering heaps of personal data even if users opt in. So there's some skepticism in the air. Now, when you open Google Chrome, you might see this new alert titled Enhanced Ad Privacy in Chrome. This can give you more control over the types of ads allowed, but it's also enabled by default. Your browser notes topics of interest based on your browsing history, and websites can use that info to show you personalized ads. So the alert button is a little bit misleading. Whether you click Got It or Settings, it's on by default, so it's essential to know how to turn it off if you want to. So to disable these, go to settings, privacy and security, add privacy, then disable each of the three different options. Now, I noticed when testing this after browsing for a new pillow, for example, that several different bedding and pillow retailer websites were shown in my site suggested ads section. So I disabled that real quick. So with this announcement, they are also rolling out real-time protections against phishing attacks for users that take advantage of the Safe Browsing tool. Now, this is updated from their older Safe Browsing feature, which looked at a local list of malicious sites to trigger a warning. They later introduced Enhanced Safe Browsing, which showed up in around 2020, to look for URLs via Google's cloud database. But Chrome sends those URLs back to Google servers to check against those databases of web malicious websites, which offers less privacy for the user. Now, Safe Browsing will have an opt-in option to enable enhanced Safe Browsing, which will offer more protection against phishing for normal users, but less privacy since some metadata is sent to Google. To combat this, they're using oblivious HTTP relays as part of Privacy Sandbox to add an extra layer of anonymity and mask IP address information. The URLs are partially hashed and data like the IP address and request headers are not exposed. Now, while Google has said any data sent to their servers will not be used for any other means, like for ads, for example, many users may be a little sus and want to disable this. This setting can be manually changed by going into your Google account, choosing security, scroll to enhanced safe browsing for your account, then choose manage enhanced safe browsing and turn it on or off. Apple has just released emergency security updates to fix not one, but two new zero-day vulnerabilities that have been actively exploited by cyber attackers. Now, these vulnerabilities targeted both iPhone and Mac users. In their recent security advisories, Apple revealed that they were aware of active exploitation of those vulnerabilities. So the first one, which is known as CVE-2023-41064, was discovered by security researchers 
issues at Citizen Lab. This vulnerability is a buffer overflow weakness found in the Image I.O. framework. It's triggered whenever maliciously crafted images are processed, and it can lead to arbitrary code execution on unpatched devices. The second vulnerability is CVE-2023-41061, and this was discovered by Apple themselves. It's related to the wallet framework and is a validation issue. Attackers can exploit it using a malicious attachment to gain arbitrary code execution on targeted devices. Now, these vulnerabilities have been exploited as part of a zero-click iMessage exploit chain, which is called BlastPass. <laughs> this chain was used to deploy the NSO group's Pegasus mercenary spyware onto fully patched iPhones. Even fully patched iPhones were not saved. So BlastPass allowed attackers to compromise iPhones running the latest iOS version without any interaction from the victim. It used passkit attachments containing malicious images sent from an attacker's iMessage account. Apple released emergency security updates to patch these vulnerabilities. So if you own an iPhone 8 or later, an iPad Pro, all models, an iPad Air 3rd generation or later, an iPad 5th gen or later, and an iPad mini 5th gen or later, then you need to update to iOS 16.6.1 or iPadOS 16.6.1 immediately. For Mac users running macOS Ventura, you should update to version 13.5.2, and if you are sporting an Apple Watch Series 4 or later, you are not off the hook either. Update to watchOS 9.6.2. Now this mark marks the 13th zero-day vulnerability that they have patched since the beginning of this year. So keep your devices updated, activate those security patches, make sure to patch them as soon as they become available. Biggest of shout outs to my Patreon supporters, especially my golden s'mores and their fur babies for making the show possible since we do not have ads on the show at all other than telling you about Patreon. So become a part of the s'mores and join folks like Brad, Ken, and all oh, them bones, all oh, them bones, all oh, them bones. I like your screen name, it's cute. You can join them over at patreon.com slash Shannon Morse. That page will give you early access to these videos, a private Discord group, a monthly live streamed Q&A session, and a lot more. Now, if you are currently a patron on the ThreatWire page, make sure to migrate over to the new one so you don't lose access to your perks. Let's go ahead and finish out today's episode with my last top story all about a major breach to Microsoft. Microsoft recently revealed that a threat actor known as Storm0558, based in China, managed to acquire an inactive consumer signing key. Now, this key was used to forge tokens and gain access to Outlook by compromising an engineer's corporate account. So here's how it happened. In April of 2021, a crash occurred in the consumer signing system, resulting in a snapshot of the crashed process known as a crash dump. Now, typically, these dumps should not include the signing key. However, due to a race condition, the key ended up in the crash dump and nobody really noticed. The crash dump containing the sensitive signing key was then moved to a debugging environment on an internet connected corporate network. This is where Storm0558 allegedly came into play, infiltrating the engineer's corporate account and accessing the dump. Now, Microsoft does not have concrete evidence of how this key was stolen due to its log retention policy policies, so we are left with a lot of unanswered questions. Microsoft reports hints at spear phishing and token stealing malware, but it does not elaborate on the exact method used by the attackers. So we don't know when the engineer's account was breached or if other accounts were compromised as well. Storm0558 managed to breach approximately 25 organizations using this signing key. They gained unauthorized access to Outlook Web Access and Outlook.com. The core issue here was a validation error that allowed the compromised key to be trusted for signing Azure AD tokens. This error began because of a programming interface that did not work as intended. To add to this complexity, Microsoft introduced a common key metadata publishing endpoint in 2018, meant to support both consumer and enterprise cloud apps. But unfortunately, human errors prevented the proper validation of which key should be used for what purpose. While Microsoft has taken steps to rectify this situation, the breach has raised questions about the security of sensitive keys and Microsoft's transparency in handling such incidents. This is a 
clear example of the need for robust security practices and continuous monitoring. Cyber threats are evolving and we have to involve with them to protect our data and our systems. Hey, I'm Shannon Morris. Make sure to stay vigilant, stay secure, and I will see you on the internet.